Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for another rendition of the BH Event Space. I am very happy to say that we are joined today by Mr. Tim Gray. Tim, thanks for joining us today. Thanks very much for having me. Yeah, we are really looking forward to this. Uh, so today, Tim is going to be talking about tips and tricks you didn't know in Adobe Lightroom Classic. So Tim will be specifically sticking to Lightroom Classic. We're not talking about any of the cloud-based stuff. So I just want to kind of eliminate any questions there that may arise. Uh, we'll be sticking straight to that classic Adobe Lightroom. So keep that in mind as you're thinking about any questions you may have for Tim. Uh, for those of us joining us on Zoom, make sure you go ahead and use the Q&A feature and you can drop any questions in there. For those of us joining on Facebook, live stream, and any other media services that we are out to right now, you can go ahead and drop any questions or comments in the link. Uh, Tim has a huge, a lengthy presentation scheduled for us, so I don't want to take up any more of his time. Tim, the floor is yours. Thanks for joining us. Take it away. Thanks very much. Appreciate that. Very nice intro, Scott. And welcome to all of you joining live. And I'm certainly happy to address your questions. We're going to talk about some, well, features that maybe you didn't know about. Hopefully some of them are at least a little bit of a surprise that you weren't aware of or learned some new tricks in terms of how to put some of these really cool features to use in Lightroom Classic. I'm Tim Gray. For those of you who don't know me, I've been working with Lightroom since the very beginning, essentially, back when it was called Lightroom, before it became Lightroom Classic. And I've written a bunch of books on Photoshop and Lightroom and a variety of other topics related to photography and now spend most of my time producing video training content for photographers to help you optimize your workflow, optimize your photography in general. And so I'm excited to talk about Lightroom Classic today in part because Lightroom is at the core of my workflow in terms of organizing my photos, optimizing my photos, and even sharing my photos. And so I put this to use. This isn't just, you know, let me show you some cool features that Adobe suggested. This represents the features that I personally put to use in my own workflow. So I hope you find this helpful. And again, I'll be happy to address any questions uh, along the way or toward the end of the presentation as well. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here so that we can dive in and take a look at Lightroom Classic. And actually, before we even get into Lightroom proper, I do want to talk about what I consider the top hidden feature in Lightroom Classic. Notice the quotes, so the air quotes, since we do have webcam here, that th this is a hidden feature, but it's one you definitely need to know about. It's sort of not a feature at all, but we're going to reveal that top hidden feature in Lightroom Classic. And that is essentially a rule that you must initiate everything in Lightroom Classic. Whenever I talk about Lightroom Classic with a group of photographers, I always have the hecklers who are going to tell me how bad Lightroom is and that it's all Adobe's fault, that none of this is working and that their workflow became a mess. I can guarantee you from my own personal experience, a vast majority of photographers who have struggled with Lightroom Classic at all, it's because they didn't follow this number one rule is that you need to initiate everything inside of Lightroom Classic. Lightroom uses a catalog that keeps track of the information about your photos. Think of this as the card catalog at the library. Actually, that was a really bad example because that totally dates me as someone who you know used to go to the library a lot. And But back in the day, you'd go to the card catalog, you'd look up a book before all the books were just online and it would tell you where to find that book, but the actual books were not in the card catalog. The books were on the shelves. And so you would go get the information about the book in the card catalog and then go off into the shelves and find the actual book. Lightroom is very similar. So now imagine you go to the card catalog, but while you're there looking for a book, somebody goes and scrambles all the shelves of books or takes all the books away. Now that catalog has information, but it's not very useful. You can't use that information to go find the book you're looking for. And so that's why it's important in the context of Lightroom Classic that everything be initiated in Lightroom. You can create new folders in Lightroom Classic. You can move folders. You can rename photos. You can move photos. But if you do any of that outside of Lightroom Classic, outside of your catalog, Lightroom's going to be confused and you're going to be frustrated. So avoid that frustration by making sure that any task that you need to do with your photos is initiated inside of Lightroom Classic. If you follow that one rule, you will avoid the frustration that many photographers have experienced with Lightroom Classic, and you'll never need my very popular course, Cleaning Up Your Mess in Lightroom Classic. All right, so then let's dive into Lightroom itself 
and take a look at some of the, I guess you could say, sort of actual features. Now, one of the things I recommend when it comes to using Lightroom to manage your photos is that you use only one catalog, a single catalog to manage all of your photos so that you don't get confused. When you launch Lightroom, you don't need to think, okay, which catalog do I open? You're in your catalog, the catalog, the only catalog. If you have any reason to use any other catalogs, maybe when you're traveling or for test purposes or because you've got catalogs from the past before you knew that you really probably shouldn't use multiple catalogs, then I suggest that you establish a default catalog. So let's go up to the menu. If you're a Windows user, you'll find this option on the edit menu. For Lightroom Classic users on the Macintosh, you'll find it on the Lightroom Classic menu up on the menu. And so Lightroom Classic for Mac users, Edit menu for Windows users, and then Preferences to bring up the Preferences dialog. And on the General tab of the Preferences dialog, you'll see that we have an option for a default catalog. And so I strongly recommend setting this pop-up to the catalog that you use as your primary catalog, hopefully your only catalog, but at least as your primary catalog, so that you know that whenever you simply launch Lightroom Classic, your primary catalog will be opened along with it. If you need to open up a backup catalog for some reason, just to check and make sure it's okay, or you open up a friend's catalog, or you've got a traveling catalog on an external hard drive, the next time by default that you launch Lightroom, it's going to open the most recently used catalog. So avoid that potential risk and just make sure. And even if you're only using a single catalog, I recommend that you establish that catalog here as the default, just to make sure, just in case you create a catalog for some other purpose later on, this will help avoid any of those problems. All right, another cool hidden feature, that one maybe it's not you know, so super hidden, but I, I find a lot of photographers aren't aware of it. We don't tend to spend a lot of time perusing the preferences dialog to see if there's any cool stuff there, but that's an option that I do suggest taking advantage of. And then also a feature that I find many photographers are not taking advantage of. It's not exactly hidden, but it's not super obvious either. And that is metadata presets. And in particular, metadata presets during the import process. So we all know what metadata is, right? Metadata for a photo. Well, for this photo, for example, let's go take a look over on the right panel. And we can see that this image was captured at a focal length of 400 millimeters. And we can see that it was captured with a particular lens and particular lens aperture and shutter speed and an exposure bias, et cetera. So we can take a look at metadata to figure out what the camera equipment was that we used to capture a photo, the camera settings, but we also have a variety of additional information that we can add to metadata. Maybe you wanna add your contact information, for example, so that if somebody finds one of your photos, they know how to contact you and pay you for the photo, hopefully, or copyright information so that hopefully people won't steal your photos and other details that you might like to add. And we can actually use a preset for metadata. And we can assign a preset to an image. And there's actually, if we take a look at the top of the metadata section of the right panel here in the library module, there's a preset section and I can choose a metadata preset. But I like to apply a preset during import in part to help streamline my workflow for organizing my photos. Now, I'm not gonna admit that I'm a forgetful person. Uh, but I'll say that I'm a really busy person, and sometimes I'm so busy that I don't get a chance to review all of my photos. And so in part, I like to use a metadata preset to help make sure that I don't forget to review some of my photos. It involves using a color label. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the notion of using star ratings, for example, to identify your favorite versus not so favorite photos, or to use a pick or reject flag likewise in Lightroom Classic. And there's also color labels that we can use for essentially any random purpose. And so I assign a red color label to every photo that I import upon import so that I know that photo has not yet been reviewed. And then once I've reviewed the photo, I remove the red color label, obviously working in batch there. So first off, we need to know what those color label definitions are if you agree that this is a great idea and you want to implement it in your own workflow. And so we're going to go up to the menu bar once again and choose metadata from the menu and then color label set. Notice, oh, Adobe, how you amuse me. There is a bridge default and a Lightroom default, essentially a preset for color labels. We can also go to the edit option to review what those values are. 
and the Lightroom defaults, you'll see a red color label gets the word red in metadata. Seems logical. And yellow gets yellow, green, green, etc. If you were using the bridge defaults, then we get the word select for a red color label, second for a yellow color label, approved for green. Uh, not necessarily the most hopeful options, but that's what Adobe Bridge used from the start and still uses. I recommend the Lightroom default options in general. They're just logical. But the key is to know what is the actual word that is being added to metadata when you assign a color label. So again, I'm using a red color label to mark photos as I've not yet reviewed them. And so I need to know the word essentially for the red color label. So it's just the word red. You could choose a different color if you like, but I like the sort of intensity, the urgency of that red color label. So I'm just making a mental note that it's the word red. I'll just cancel here, not to change any of those settings. And then once again, back to the metadata menu, then I want to edit my metadata presets, essentially to create a metadata preset, presumably. So again, from the metadata menu, edit metadata presets, and that will bring up a dialogue. I've already created my own preset. So I'm just gonna choose that from the list so that I can show you what this looks like. If you didn't have your own preset, you would just fill in the information here that you want to use. So one of the more important ones for me personally in this case is to put in the label field, which relates to the color label, the word associated with the color label I want, so the word red, and then to make sure over on the right side that the checkbox is turned on. So a metadata preset will take whatever information I decide that I want to include in the preset and sort of rubber stamp it onto, in this case, a set of images that I'm going to import, for example. And so that enables me to apply whatever information I might like, but I need to be somewhat generic, you might say. I need to make sure that whatever information I put into a metadata preset will apply equally to every photo I'm importing. So I wish I could say a five-star rating, for example, but every now and then I capture an image that's not a five-star image. But things like copyright information, you can see here, and contact information down below. So I can fill in any of those details that I'd like and turn on the checkbox. If I start to add a, the creator phone here in this case, if I start typing into one of these fields, so notice that the checkbox is not turned on for the phone number field. And if I start typing a number in this case, notice as soon as I type into a field, the checkbox gets turned on. So I can pick and choose which information I'm including in the preset. In this case, again, I already have a preset created, but if you did not have one yet, you could fill in the details that you'd like to use, including possibly that color label, and then click the preset pop-up at the top and choose the option to save current settings as a new preset. You can then type a name for the preset. So I use my own name and the word import just to remind myself that's the preset that I want to apply to all of the new images that I import. I'll go ahead and just cancel in this case and click done down at the bottom right since I already have that preset. I won't save, and I don't actually have any photos to import at the moment, but just to demonstrate, just to illustrate briefly here, the fact that it is indeed possible. I'll bring up the import dialog, and over on the right panel, notice that in the apply during import section, we have the metadata pop-up where I can choose that metadata preset that I created. And so in this case, the key being my contact information, my copyright information, and that red color label marking all of my brand new photos that I'm importing as not yet having been reviewed. I'll just go ahead and cancel since I don't actually need to import any photos at the moment, but I have some images that I have imported. And let's assume this is a brand new folder. It's not, it's from 2019, but here's this cruise 2019 folder. Notice over toward the right, the folder itself has a red color label. This is a really cool feature. It's a relatively new feature in Lightroom Classic that gives us the ability to identify a folder with a label to sort of highlight. Because the problem is, what you might not have realized is that in this folder that I'm browsing right now, there are photos that I've not yet reviewed they have a red color label. I'm gonna press the letter G on the keyboard to switch to the grid view display. You can see some star ratings assigned to a handful of these images. So obviously I've started reviewing those photos, but as I scroll down a bit, you'll see that I then have red color labels. So this is really the key reason that I use that metadata preset on import is to mark these images so that I know, oh, I still have photos to review. 
But if I don't go browsing the folder, if I don't go look inside of every folder to try to figure out where I've got some red color labels or go create a filter, set up a filter for red labels for all photographs, for example, I can just very easily set a little bit of a sort of flag for myself by assigning a red color label, not only to the images that need to be reviewed, but to the folder itself. So I could just right click on a folder within the folders list. And then from the pop-up menu, choose to add a color label to the folder. And you'll see the same color labels that are available for photos are also available for folders and collections. And so here in the case of a folder, I could assign the red color label. It's already there, of course. I could change the color to something else. I could also remove the red color label if I were finished reviewing all of the images in this folder by choosing that none option. Notice in addition to that red color label, a little bit of a red flag to remind me that I have some photos that need to be reviewed there. There's also a little star associated with that folder that indicates that that folder has a favorite status, sort of like a star rating for photos, except it's not one to five stars, for example, it's just a yes or no, is it a favorite or isn't it? And so I can go, let's go find another folder here. The Austria 2018 folder, for example, is not currently a favorite. I can right click on that folder and then choose mark favorite to indicate that I want this folder to also have favorite status. Notice it gets that little star there as well. And of course here, this is just a, a demo catalog, so it doesn't have a tremendous number of folders, but I can also filter my folders. You might already be familiar with what is essentially a search facility. So if I'm looking for a folder of images or well, a folder that contains images from a cruise, for example, I could type cruise and you'll see that then I only am able to see the folders that have that text in the folder name. And of course their parent folders as well. I'm gonna clear out with that little X, I'll clear out that search. Over to the left, that magnifying glass is actually a pop-up. And so I can click the pop-up and choose to view all folders, of course, or only the favorite folders or only folders with a particular color label. And so I could use red, for example, and say, oh, I've got a couple folders here where I've not yet reviewed all of the photos in those folders. Let's go get caught up on that work and review the images, assign some star ratings, for example. And then once I've reviewed to decide whether a photo is a favorite versus maybe an outtake that I'm going to delete, then I can remove the color labels, of course, from the images themselves. And then once I've totally finished working with a folder, at least in terms of reviewing images for favorite status, so to speak, then I could naturally remove the color label for the folder itself. And so a really helpful feature in terms of being able to track down, I don't know about you, but I tend to end up with lots and lots of folders for my photos. And so it's very helpful to be able to filter based on essentially a search for the folder name. And speaking of searching, very often, I'm gonna switch this back to all folders so that I can see everything. Very often when I'm looking for an image, I'll use the library filter bar. And it's pretty straightforward. I imagine most of you have already made use of the library filter bar. So it shows up at the top of the grid view display. It's not displayed as part of the loop view display. I'm still in that search field, so we'll come out over here. Press E to go into the loop view display. So you'll see there's no library filter at the top of the loop view display. It's at the top of the grid view display. Keyboard shortcut, by the way, G for the grid view display and the letter E for the loop view display because L was already taken, but just remember that there's an E on the end of loop. And if you don't see the library filter bar here up at the top, we can go up to the menu and choose view and there's a show filter bar option, but this is one that I tend to use a lot. So I might hide a reveal. I like to keep in mind that there's a backslash keyboard shortcut when I'm in the library module to hide or reveal that library filter. And so let's say, for example, I'm just looking for some favorite photos. So I'm gonna to go to my attribute option and I'll set my star rating to one or above. By the way, I use one star to indicate a keeper. And so I don't use one star to mark a bad image. To me, there's just no sense. If it's a bad image, it either gets no stars or it gets deleted. And so one star is sort of my starting point for marking favorite photos. And then I'll upgrade from there based on how favorite that photo might be. And so here I'm filtering based on one star or greater. Well, by default, if I then switch to a different folder, 
then the filter is removed. So now you're seeing once again, photos that don't have a star rating. Here's a two star rated image over here, and there's a one star over here, but these images don't have a star. This one's even a rejected photo. And that's because by default, the filter criteria actually resets when I switch to a different location, a different folder, different collection. So I'm gonna turn on my attribute option and I could search by text or by various metadata values. I'm just using attribute because it's a common option that I make use of the filter based on star ratings. And so once I have identified my attributes, then I like to have the lock enabled, this tiny little lock that you might not have ever noticed, or if you noticed it, might not have known what it did. That is to lock the criteria for our search. And so now, again, I'm filtering based on one star or greater. And now when I navigate to a different folder, you can see this folder happens to have 441 images in it. But because I have that filter set, then if we take a look on the film strip, I'm only now viewing 37 out of the 441 photos. As I scroll through, you see there not a huge number of photos. And now as I navigate among my various folders, you'll see that the filter criteria are locked. So in each case, when I navigate to a new folder, I'm only seeing the images that meet those criteria. So I'm gonna set this to a two star rating, for example, and then let's go see, well, we've got some two star rated images there. Uh, in this folder, I have no images that meet the criteria. Apparently 2012 was not a great year for me to photograph in Austria. No images made it up to the two star rating. But that indicates then, of course, there's no photos that match the filter. I could change the filter. I could set the filter option to none to see all of the images in that folder, only 13 images in this case, not a really big folder. But the key is that when I have filter criteria established, I generally want to lock the criteria so that I can actually find the images more smoothly. So here, for example, if I'm looking for some you know, real favorite photos, two star or better, I'll lock that filter criteria. And now I can just go navigate among various folders and the filter criteria will remain locked. As I switch from different folders or collections, I'm always only going to see the photos that match the criteria because I have that lock enabled. So in fact, I never turn off that lock, which is not true, but I only ever turn off that lock when I'm demonstrating why I always keep that lock enabled. I always lock the filter criteria so that when I've established my filter values, my attributes or my metadata settings, that I'm only seeing images with those particular criteria. I can always change the criteria. I can always turn off the filter so I can see all images within the current folder or collection, for example. And then when I do turn on a filter criteria, as I navigate among different folders, it remains locked. I think it's just a, a great, very, very helpful feature in terms of being able to track down your photos and especially for filter criteria that you tend to use somewhat frequently. And then renaming photos. And I find so many photographers struggle a little bit with renaming and this, remember that rule right from the start that I said, everything should be initiated in Lightroom. If you wanna rename a folder or a photo, that's no problem, but do it inside of Lightroom Classic. Well, many photographers I find struggle. They can't figure out how to rename their images. They know, for example, that you can rename during the import process. When you import photos into Lightroom Classic, just as you can assign that metadata preset that I demonstrated to add your copyright information, your contact information, maybe the color label as I demonstrated, that works. You can also rename your photos, but then photographers don't seem to realize you can rename later. If they do, then they still struggle sometimes with renaming an individual image. And it, so it's kind of a little bit of a hidden feature, but it's such a simple, easy feature. And so let's go take a look. Actually, in this case, let's go to all photographs because we can actually, it's one of the things that's great about Lightroom Classic. If anybody ever criticizes Lightroom Classic, and there's some fair criticisms to be sure about Lightroom Classic, but if they talk about the catalog being a negative overall, one of the most important, one of the, the best benefits of using Lightroom Classic is that I can filter, I can search based on my entire catalog. And as I mentioned, this is just a demonstration catalog. My actual catalog that contains my personal photos contains over 400,000 photos and videos. 
probably I should delete some outtakes, but the point is that I have a lot of photos and I can filter across them all very easily. I can go to all photographs in the catalog section up at the top of the left panel in the library module and then set a filter criteria on the library filter bar. And now, for example, I'm only seeing my two star or better images in the entire catalog. So it's a huge advantage to Lightroom Classic, I would say. And so I'm using that option. And let's, uh, in fact, let's use text. You might be familiar if you have sent images over to Photoshop from Lightroom Classic that you will end up with a file name by default that includes the word text. Oh, sorry, that includes the word edit. I'm searching by text. That includes the word edit at the tail end of that file name. And so, for example, here's an image. It looks like that I must have sent over to Photoshop, apparently for a little bit of a, well, in this case, a wild effect for the image. Uh, here's a, an oil painting effect, for example, for this image. But if you take a look on the film strip, you'll see that I have that dash edit. And then when I sent the original TIFF over to Photoshop a second time, it got another dash edit. And so I have this file name, well, for starters, the file name isn't the best file name in the world. So maybe I would want to change that in general. But at the very least, I might want to use something other than just dash edit. Now there's a setting in preferences, but you might want a unique file name, of course, for each individual photo so that you could search for it, for example. And what I find many photographers don't realize is that you don't have to use that batch renaming to rename an individual photo. We can simply rename an individual image. And so I've selected a photo right down here on the film strip. You can see the image that I've selected. The file name is you know, random letters and numbers and then dash edit, dash edit dot tiff. Well, over on the right panel in the metadata section in the library module, we have the file name. And the file name, you'll notice it has a box around it. It is a text box. Whereas for example, the lens focal length in this case was 400 millimeters. And that does not have a box around it. It's just text. It's just letters and you know, letters and, and numbers in this case, 400 millimeters. Well, the fact that there's no text box, that there's no box around 400 millimeters, that indicates that that is not an editable field. I can't you know, try to impress my friends and say, oh no, it's a 600 millimeter lens. Look at the metadata because it's not editable right here. They're gonna know it was just a 400 millimeter lens. Well, just, but the fields that have boxes around them that are text boxes are editable. And so for example, I could change the color label right here. It's easier to just use a keyboard shortcut, for example, but that also includes the file name. If I want to rename this photo, I can just go into the file name field here in the metadata section on the right panel, and I'll just take out the edit edit, and I'll call this oil paint, because this happens to be an image that I've applied the oil paint filter from Photoshop to the image. So I've just changed that file name in the file name field over on the right panel here in the metadata section, press enter or return to apply that change. And I Oh, because now where'd the image go? That's another good hidden, hidden tip, a hidden feature, so to speak, or a hidden glitch it might seem like, but this is a good thing. But the file name actually did get changed on the hard drive. Yes, that's one of the top questions I get when it comes to something like this, making a change to the file name. Yes, if I rename the photo as in this case, or a folder in Lightroom Classic, that change will also be reflected out on the hard drive itself. So where did the image go? Where did that file name go? It looks like the file name didn't change. Remember, I had two different copies of this image and the one that I renamed magically disappeared. Why is that? Well, it's actually very simple. I'm gonna to switch to the grid view here. I searched based on edit. And when I renamed that image, I got rid of the edit in the file name. Let's go find with, I'll just type oil here. And here sure enough is the image that I renamed to include oil paint on the tail end of that file name. And so that gives me the ability to very quickly and easily rename an individual photo for whatever reason. This is just one example of a scenario where you might want to rename. If the, you know that dash edit isn't exactly all that useful, you can update the file name to give a little bit of a clue, which number one will sort of remind you, you can take a look at the file name here or down on the film strip, for example, but also, then when you're searching, so here I search based on oil, I could have searched based on paint, et cetera. 
So it gives me number one, a really quick and easy way to rename a photo, but also being able to use that information then to locate an image or remind myself about particular details about the photo. All right, let's, shall we talk about a feature that everyone loves to make fun of, it seems. And so let's go to a folder here and I'm gonna turn off my filters and we'll track down some photos. So obviously here we've got some red color labels. I need to go in and assign star ratings to my favorites. But more to the point here is that I might want to assign some keywords to a photo. And so here we have a photo that includes a crop duster as well as a crop. This happens to be canola. And we have another photo over here that includes canola, but no crop duster. And down here we have a photo that includes a crop duster, but no canola. And I might want to add keywords. And I think keywords are important really for two reasons. Number one, keywords, as I imagine you all can appreciate, are helpful when it comes to locating a photo of a particular subject. Hey, Tim, do you have any photos of crop dusters? Yes, let me search based on the keyword crop duster. But first, I need to assign the keyword to the images. And so, of course, you probably don't want to spend a lot of time keywording every single photo. But at the very least, I recommend keywording your favorite photos, and especially when it comes to photos that you think you might want to search for based on particular subject matter. But also, the other benefit of keywords. So I think of this as keywords essentially operating in two directions. One, as I've already talked about, you can use keywords to search for a photo, but also what happens when you locate a particular photo and you don't remember what the subject was or the name of the subject, for example, the, the name of the person that appears in the photo or the name of the building or you know whatever the case might be, the keyword is also a helpful reminder so that when I find this image, let's you know, say I find this photo, for example, I could look into the keywords and remind myself, what is that crop? Ah, it's canola. Yes, of course. And so again, that two direction benefit of keywords. And what I find many photographers do is they go through even let's say they've assigned star ratings to identify favorite photos, and they might then just start with the beginning. And so, you know, here's an image and okay, this I'm going to give keyword of windmill, of course. And this one also gets windmill and there's crop duster and canola and crop duster and canola. And that's I don't even know, but some grain that's going to get bailed up into hay bales, essentially. And there's, you know, an old abandoned homestead farmhouse with some canola and some wheat and uh, more photos, et cetera. And so one by one, oh, here's a totally different crop altogether. And here's, you know, a fallow field. And here's a little bit of a, you know, sort of a gas station mock-up. And so image by image. And I find that if you take an assembly line approach to keywording, it gives you a big advantage in terms of performance, which brings us to the feature that many photographers like to make fun of, and that is the painter. And the painter, first off, I'm in the grid view display, and on the toolbar down below the grid view display, you should find that spray paint can. If you don't have the toolbar in general, the letter T, as in toolbar, enables you to hide or reveal. So it's a toggle, so I can hide and reveal the toolbar. If for some reason you don't see the painter, maybe somebody told you that it's a childish toy that you shouldn't play with, then you might have hidden the painter. Well, down at the far right of the toolbar, you'll find this little triangle. That's actually a pop-up where we can pick and choose which options we want to have available on the toolbar. And it's unique, by the way, for the grid view versus the loop view display, but you can customize. And so you'd want to make sure in this case that the painter is enabled, indicated by that check mark. And so, yes, this cute, silly little spray can, the painter control that we can use to paint onto our images, but not paint with paint, but paint with metadata. So I'm going to click on the painter in order to activate it. And so now my mouse takes on that little spray can appearance. And then to the right of the painter, you'll see the paint option. What do I want to apply to the images that I paint? And in this case, I'm going to use keywords. You'll see there's some other metadata options, essentially, that we can use to assign details to a photo. So in this case, keywords. And let's start off with canola, since I had previously typed that in for my own convenience. So now my painter is ready to paint canola as a keyword. And I could separate additional keywords with commas, for example. So it's you know canola and crop and agriculture and whatever the case might be. But in this case, I'll just use that one keyword for the moment. And this image includes canola. And so I can simply click on the image 
and the keyword, in this case, canola, gets assigned to the photo. Notice that now I have a white box or frame around the image, which indicates that this photo has the current keyword from the painter assigned to it. There's another, and then we get to another cool feature here. So I've clicked on another photo that includes canola. Here I have two in a row. We can actually, this is a spray can after all, not just a, a spot brush, I guess. And so I can click and drag across multiple photos in order to assign that keyword, in this case, to multiple images. There's two more, so I'll drag across those. Let's scroll down. And so notice I'm focused just on canola. So I can scan much more quickly. That's also canola. I can scan much more quickly to find the photos that include whatever the keyword might be, in this case, canola, and just work very, very quickly in that assembly line fashion, sort of you know one keyword or one concept at a time. I'll switch our keyword to crop duster. And so then I can scroll through quickly. Not that I need to go fast, but that's one of the benefits of the painter for metadata is that we're able to operate fairly quickly. So here's a row of six images featuring crop dusters. So I can just click and drag across all six of those. And there's two more right there. And then I could switch to my other keywords as the case may be. And so especially, you know, if you're photographing a variety of different subjects in sort of a random order, if you go on safari in Africa, you might photograph a zebra, then you photograph some elephants, then giraffes, then more zebras, and then a lion, and then leopards, you know, whatever the case might be. And so with that painter, you're able to just focus on essentially one keyword or one concept or other metadata as well. But I find that especially helpful for keywords so that you can work very, very quickly. So it's one of those features a lot of photographers like to make fun of. It's cute and adorable and funny, but it also can be very, very helpful in terms of working more efficiently, more quickly in assigning keywords, which I find for most photographers, not their favorite task when it comes to organizing their photos. And then when we're all finished with the painter, we can click back in that circle where I initially grabbed the painter or we can also click the done button at the far right of that toolbar in order to essentially put that painter away. So a feature that I think is very, very helpful when it comes to assigning keywords to your photos. And then let's take a look at another favorite feature and this relates to location. So for me personally, most of my photography typically involves traveling somewhere, going somewhere for the purpose of photography. And I'm kind of a map person. I mean, I guess we all know I'm a nerd anyway, right? I'm, I'm obviously a computer person. <laughs> and so I also happen to be into maps, maybe not a big surprise. And so I really appreciate the map module in Lightroom, which enables me to see my photos on the map, to see where my photos were captured. Now, if you've been looking for an excuse to buy a new camera, you've come to the right place. Uh, and in fact, I'm sure BNH can help you with that. So this, I would say it doesn't require, but it certainly helped if you have a camera with a built-in GPS receiver. So your smartphone already has this capability. And so smartphone photos would automatically appear on the map in Lightroom Classic. And you might have a camera, a mirrorless or a digital SLR that has a built-in GPS receiver, or you might've gotten an accessory GPS receiver for your camera. Not every camera has this feature, but if location is sort of a key consideration for your photos, if you'd like to be reminded about where you photographed a particular subject so you can get back to that location and photograph it again, then having built-in GPS is very helpful. You can also create track logs with the smartphone app, for example, so that you can then synchronize your photos to a track log. I'm gonna go to the all photographs collection just to get started here. And so I can view all images in my entire Lightroom Classic catalog, and I'll make sure my filter is set to none. And then I will switch to the map module, and that will give us a map view of my images. So here I happen to be browsing a photo from the Palouse, but I can zoom out and take a look, and I'll switch this to the roadmap styles. It's just a little bit easier to see and interpret. And again, this is just a, a demonstration catalog that has a relatively small number of photos, but you can see that my photos appear on the map essentially automatically in terms of being able to see where I captured the image. And so that can be helpful if I track down a photo. So in fact, let me switch to the library module. Here's another cool hidden feature. And let's say that I want to find out you know, where a particular photo was captured. Uh, so 
let's see, those don't have GPS because those were indoors. But uh, here, for example, we have the uh, bell towers, church towers of Salzburg, Austria. But if you couldn't remember where those photos were captured, you can look at the keywords, hopefully, if you had keyworded the images. But also this little badge. So on the thumbnails for the images, by default, you'll see badges. The leftmost one indicates that there are keywords that have been assigned to this image, a little tag. The rightmost indicates that the image has been adjusted in the develop module. We have the collections badge here. And this one that looks a little bit like a push pin, or at least it's supposed to look like a push pin, that indicates that there are GPS coordinates in metadata for this image. I can actually click on that badge to be taken to that location, the location where this photo was captured on the map. I could zoom in, get a little bit of a closer look, for example. And here, a wonderful vantage point up at the uh, Museum of Modern Art, this nice, as it mentions here on the map, cliff top location where you're looking out into the heart of Salzburg. And so you can see exactly where the photos were captured. Now that's handy for reminding yourself of where particular images were captured. But I also find that the map can be helpful for locating photos when I'm not even necessarily looking for a particular photo. So I could you know, just kind of browse around the map and zoom in. And oftentimes, you know, the map itself will remind me about particular photos, particular photo experiences that I had, for example. So here, and in Australia, and if we zoom in a little bit closer, we'll find that these photos happen to have been captured in or on Kangaroo Island in Australia. And yes, indeed, Kangaroo Island does have kangaroos. And so we can go find a you know particular photo that had been captured. And so again, just using that map to remind myself of different photo possibilities based on just browsing the map, based on locations that I visited. And so I find that that's one of the features that many photographers are not taking advantage of. Now, if you're a portrait photographer, obviously location, if you're photographing portraits in the studio, same studio every time, then obviously the location information is not going to be as helpful. But if you travel for some of your photography, then that location information can certainly be very, very helpful. All right, let's shift gears here just a little bit and take a look at some cool features and a set of related features here in terms of targeted adjustments. And so I'm just gonna use one example. Let's go find a photo here. Uh, so several photos here that I'll just talk about briefly and then give you a demonstration for just one of them because the basic concept is the same for all of these different features. Uh, the specifics of how to implement them are obviously a little bit different, but the idea is that we can focus our targeted adjustments. And so, for example, I'm going to switch over to the develop module, and we'll take a look at one of our targeted adjustment options. So for targeted adjustments, we have the graduated filter, sort of like a graduated split neutral density filter. We have the radial filter, which is an elliptical shape, so we can affect only the edges of the photo or only the interior of the photo. And then the adjustment brush where we can paint our adjustment into any area of the image that we'd like. So let's use the graduated filter because it's a, a good example I find. I'm going to set my exposure down to a really strong negative value just so we have a strong adjustment to start with that makes it a little easier to see exactly what's going on. And we'll run into the classic problem of using a graduated split neutral density filter to hold back the sky, for example. I can click and drag to define my gradient but now that rock cairn is sticking up into the sky, sticking up into my gradient. So now I'm adjusting the rock in addition to the sky. And so I would like to be able to focus. So this is already a targeted adjustment, an adjustment that only affects a specific area of the photo based on a gradient in this case. Now I want to focus it even more. In this case, I would want to focus based on color. And so I could define a range mask where I'm limiting the adjustment to only blue, for example. Or with this image, I might use that same concept in order to apply the adjustment only to the bright areas and not to the dark areas of the image and based on this existing gradient. Or another clever, cool example. So again, I can focus my adjustment based on color values, based on tonal values, but how about based on depth? If any of you have a smartphone, 
Okay, you all have a smartphone, I'm sure. But if your smartphone has a portrait mode, so recent iPhone models include a, a portrait feature where we can capture a photo and get reduced depth of field. Essentially opening the lens aperture wide open, as it were, except on a little smartphone, we essentially, I, well, I was gonna say you can't, I think I would actually describe it as the, the aperture is always wide open. The issue is more that with such a tiny little sensor, you're going to get lots of depth of field. And so when, when a smartphone enables you to create a portrait mode type of shot, what's really happening is it's taking two pictures essentially, one in focus, one out of focus, and then it uses a depth map to figure out what's close to the camera, what's far away from the camera, and we'll blur the distant pixels and we'll keep sharp the close pixels. Well, that depth map can be used by Lightroom Classic as well. So as long as you have a camera, such as a smartphone, and I'm sure this is going to expand before too long where we'll have depth maps with a variety of different cameras, but at least for now, smartphone photos that have that portrait feature supported, you can use the embedded depth map. And so let's once again, apply a graduated adjustment. I'll just use the exact same adjustment here. So I have this graduated adjustment. Let's assume that I wanted to darken the background, maybe more to this example, I might wanna blur the background, but I don't want to affect the adorable dog in the foreground. Uh, this adorable dog, by the way, has more followers on Instagram than I do, but we have an adjustment that is affecting more than what we really want. Well, let's now take a look at our range mask options. So when I'm working with one of my targeted adjustments in Lightroom Classic, I'll have a range mask feature. Its default setting is off. I can click the pop-up there. And for the rock cairn against the blue sky, I would use color and then select just the blue of the sky as the area that I want to adjust. For the luminance option, I can use sliders to define which area of the image based on tonal value do I want to adjust versus not adjust. And then in this case, depth based on distance from my smartphone. And so I'll choose the depth option and you'll see that I have a range set of sliders. And so I can choose which area of the image is going to be affected versus not affected based on distance. And so I can zero in the range and adjust the smoothness of my transition. So maybe not too smooth, so I don't have too much blending of the transition. And I can see now if I, the foreground, so the left slider is for close stuff. So I can turn off the adjustment for the near objects or for the far objects with that right slider. In this case, I only want the adjustment affecting the stuff that's far away. So over toward the right side. So I'll bring that left slider inward. Obviously in this case, with an exaggerated adjustment, it's a little easier to see what's going on. And then once I've got the depth map, in this case for the range masking pretty well defined, then I could go back and make different adjustments. So for example, I probably don't want to darken quite that much, maybe darken up a little bit. I might use a negative value for sharpness in order to blur that area just a little bit, maybe a negative value for clarity as well for the same purpose, perhaps for texture as well. Maybe not darken it up quite so much, but again, whatever adjustments I would like to apply in a targeted way, affecting only certain areas of the image, but I can also use that range masking to further limit based on color values, based on tonal values, and based on, in this case, depth, the distance from the camera. I'm gonna turn on, in fact, that show depth map checkbox so that you can see that we are applying an adjustment. The red area indicates where the adjustment is active, but notice the shades of gray that indicate with light being closer, medium being middle distance, dark being further away. So that little map, you'll also notice it's not the most high resolution depth map, it's pretty good. But if you've used portrait mode with your smartphone, you may have realized, you may have seen some evidence along the edges that there's, you know, the hair, for example, is partially in focus and partially out of focus, those sorts of things. And so it's not perfect, but it's pretty darn cool. And as long as you don't apply an adjustment that is too exaggerated, the effect can actually work out quite nicely. All right, so I do want to talk also about resetting adjustments. I imagine we might have some questions, maybe just one or two. And so uh, Scott or whoever's handling questions, if you want to pipe in with those, feel free uh, or, you know, maybe take a look and see if you've got some great questions there. I'm going to mention though some of the options for resetting, some of which are really obvious, some of which not so much, a little bit of hidden features. So first off, 
with many of our adjustments and even adjustment sections. So notice, you know, for my tone curve, HSL, et cetera, I have this little toggle switch. To me, it looks like a light switch, so I can turn on the lights or turn off the lights. And this enables me, uh, first and foremost, I would say to get a before versus after. I can turn off the adjustment, in this case, my targeted adjustment, and then turn it back on again. And so before, after, but also I could just leave the option turned off. If I decide that, you know, one of my adjustments, let's go down into, you know, color grading. Uh, let's, we'll leave that turned on for the moment. Go into color grading. And let's say that I, I'll go into my global option and I'll shift the color. And I say, okay, obviously I don't know how to use this feature. I'm making a real mess of the color. I can just turn off that section and forget about it. I don't have to reset. But I also have the ability to reset. So you'll notice in some cases with my targeted adjustment, for example, I have a reset option so that I can reset to the default settings. I also, let's go into, I'll go into the basic section here. I can also reset individual sections. So you notice I have a heading for presence versus tone. If you hold the Alt key on Windows or the Option key on Macintosh, the label will change to indicate, in this case, for example, reset tone or reset presence. And I can then click on that text. So hold the Alt or Option key and then click where it says, for example, reset presence to reset those presence values. Or let's bring those values back up a little bit, bring up our saturation with the vibrance control. If you feel that you've taken things a little too far, so texture is sort of like sharpening. It is enhancing contrast for very, very fine details in the image. Here, it makes the image look a little bit too crunchy, for example. And so I might want to reset just texture, not the overall presence set of adjustments, but just texture. We can double click on any slider handle in order to reset that particular control to its default values. Obviously we have the history. You might've noticed over on the left panel here, I've got my history that's racking up all sorts of adjustments. And so I could go back in time. I could go back to an earlier history state. I can also use the undo command, control Z on Windows, command Z on Macintosh. But very often I find it's just easier to work with my individual adjustments. And so if I need to reset any of those adjustments, a simple double click on the slider handle works wonderfully well. I suppose I should mention another cool hidden feature the text value. So any of our adjustments have numeric. So most of the adjustments have numeric values associated with them. If I knew what value I wanted, I could actually just click into the field and type a new value. I need, you know, 47 for shadows instead of 45, for example. But also notice as I hover over the number that I get an icon, a mouse pointer that has a hand with the double headed arrow, I can actually just click and drag. So I can drag left or right directly on the numeric value. But if I really want to exercise fine control, I can click into the numeric value, into the text field for whichever adjustment it is that I would like to make changes to, and then use the up arrow key. So in this case, shadows, pressing up arrow repeatedly, and we'll see we're increasing, incrementing by a value of one each time, or down arrow to reduce the value. I can also hold the shift key to increase the strength of that adjustment essentially. And for most adjustments, it's a tenfold increase. So now holding the shift key, I'll get increases of 10 at a time rather than one at a time. So 17 to 27 to 37 to 47, and then down arrow to, with the shift key to get down to 37, 27, et cetera. So that can be very helpful for just fine tuning the adjustments. Shift up and down arrow for larger adjustments, usually a tenfold difference, but it, it depends on the particular adjustment. And then without the shift key, just the up and down arrow keys on the keyboard in order to be able to increase or decrease in smaller increments, typically in whole numbers, again, depending on the specific adjustment. All right, do we have any questions? Yes, yes, Tim, just thank you so much. <laughs> just just a few, just a few, maybe like, maybe a half a question now. <laughs> there you go, yeah, exactly. Um, I, well, I mean, let, let, let's start off by first saying, you know, amazing that a dog has, you know, more followers and likes than, than, than you, Tim. But it is maybe, far maybe better some of, looking than I am, so. <laughs> well, maybe maybe some of the people tuning in, you know, can, can head to your Instagram account and help out with that. I mean, I definitely learned more from you than this beautiful dog, as beautiful as, <laughs> as it is. Uh, I, I, and, in this past hour. So, you know, sure. if anybody wants to pick up some tips or anything like that and, and get some value out of it, you know, beyond just the cute, lovable 
Huggable dog. <laughs> Follow Tim. I think I think he's uh, got some information to share. Um, so I'll, I'll start off. I like to throw a nice soft curveball out there, real, sure. real, really in the beginning, just to ease things in. Uh, we had a question coming in, uh, going back all the way to the beginning. Can you just explain what what is a card catalog? <laughs> Uh, you, the library maybe that wasn't the best analogy is that what you're saying <laughs> oh no 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 that's great that's great that's great i think i think maybe somebody you know didn't catch somebody that legitimately they, doesn't they, know what that is yeah you know it, it, that's it happens. Fair. I, yeah that's fair and so you know like i said i like to start off nice and easy and then and then ramp up so are you exactly. ready absolutely so yeah <laughs> so the, know, catalog, now, now the dewey decimal system <laughs> Now I'm really exactly. dating myself, aren't I? For, for those who don't know what the Dewey Decimal System is, go to your library, you know, <laughs> you, you ask the librarian. They can, there you go. They can, exactly. they can break that down for you. <laughs> there, there's also Google, but, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll let the librarians live a little bit too. There you go. <laughs> um, Robert, Robert and Mark kind of had uh, questions that sort of kind of piggybacked off of each other. Uh, sure. Robert was saying that right now he's using his Lightroom setup where all of his files are stored on his server. Uh, they're in the same location as his image files. He would like to know how can he move those to the catalog on his laptop where he does all his editing so he can work with previews when he's not attached to his server. Similarly, Mark was saying, you know, how can he go from one catalog, but, you know, how can he use it on the desktop or the laptop? So when he's out in the field with his laptop, right. he edited, edits them out of the field, they'll still be reflected when he gets back home on his desktop. Yeah, so a great set of questions, related questions, obviously. So one of the key things to keep in mind about the catalog is that to work in Lightroom Classic, you need to have access to your catalog. But actually, you don't necessarily need to have access to your photos, uh, depending on what it is you're trying to accomplish. So for example, working in the library module, you could update metadata for your photos, even without the original images available. If you want to be able to switch between computers, then you probably want to have your Lightroom Classic catalog on an external hard drive probably along with your photos. On an external hard drive, performance isn't going to be quite as fast, generally speaking, depending on the specific drive you're using, but it does give you that convenience of being able to just disconnect the hard drive from your desktop computer, for example, and then plug that hard drive into your laptop computer and open up the catalog. Obviously, you need to have Lightroom Classic installed on each of those computers, but then you can move your photos and your catalog around with no problem whatsoever. So if you want to actually move your catalog, then of course, the first thing is you need to know where that catalog is actually stored. And you can get that information in the catalog settings dialog. And so once again, for Macintosh users, that'll be on the Lightroom classic menu on the menu bar. For Windows users, that's on the edit menu. And we go into catalog settings and on the general tab, you'll find an indication of where the catalog is and what it's called and when it was created, when you last backed it up, et cetera. But for our purposes here, the more important thing is that we have that show button. And so I can click on the show button to bring up, here it is, a window in my operating system. Let me just switch this over to my display that I'm sharing. Here we are. And so this is a window in my operating system, obviously, presented by Lightroom Classic with the folder that contains my catalog highlighted. If I want to move my catalog to an external hard drive or you know whatever the case, it's already on external, you want it on your internal, or it's on your internal, you want it on your external, you just have to move this catalog first. Let's get back into Lightroom and we would quit Lightroom Classic. So I'm not gonna quit at the moment because I'll bet there might be more questions in Lightroom, but we would quit Lightroom Classic and then move this entire folder because it contains your catalog file, your previews file, all your different helper files. And I say move in air quotes because I'm paranoid. And whenever I think about moving something that's really, really important, like my catalog in Lightroom Classic, I don't actually move, I copy. But I copy, so for example, I might drag and drop this folder onto an external hard drive that contains all of my photos. And then since I copied, my existing catalog is still going to be here, then I would just rename it. And I typically just put backup in all caps at the beginning of the folder name, for example, so that I know this is extra. I don't necessarily need this. I could delete it if I need to free up hard drive space, but just in case anything goes wrong in the transfer, I like to have that additional backup. And then once the catalog is in the new location, you could go to the folder that contains it and to make sure that you're launching Lightroom with that catalog, wherever it might be, just double click 
on the LR cat as in Lightroom catalog file. Just double click and that will launch Lightroom Classic and open up that catalog. Don't forget that tip about specifying the default catalog. If you've moved your catalog to a different location, then obviously you'll wanna update the preferences to indicate that default catalog as well. Great, and, and Mark, Mark did uh, kind of want to just clarify and then sort of follow up with a question. So Mark, thanks for sticking with us. Uh, he wanted to know, could he store the catalog in the creative cloud and link it, link, sorry, link both computers to it there? No. Simple, it, simple, <laughs> easy answer. No, it, It's sorry. conceivably <laughs> possible. So a lot of photographers actually do use, for example, Dropbox and some of these other cloud-based storage solutions to store their catalog in the cloud. It is feasible. It can be done. I do not recommend it because there's just a risk, you know, that synchronization when you use a software such as Dropbox or iCloud or the Creative Cloud in terms of file storage sort of synchronization, you're having, you'll have a copy on your hard drive locally and then it gets synchronized to the cloud. So you make a change to a file such as your Lightroom catalog and then whatever service you're using synchronizes that catalog to the cloud. And then on your other computer, you can open that catalog from the cloud. There's a risk though, that what if you're not connected to the internet and you don't realize it, your connection dropped, you think you're up to date, you switch to another computer and you're not necessarily using the latest version of the catalog. And so as a general rule, yes, it could be done, but I do not recommend using that type of a service for storing your catalog in particular. Great. Great. So uh, going over to, uh, you know, kind of talking about naming photos and things like that, Vic's also joining us here on Zoom and wanted to know if if you rename an image in the library module under photographs and rename the photos, is the name of the photo also going to be reflected on the hard drive as well? Yes, absolutely. And it's an important thing to understand that, you know, rule I started off with that you need to do all these things inside of Lightroom Classic. And part of that is because if you make a change inside of Lightroom Classic to your file name, your folder name, your overall folder structure, if you move a file, that is absolutely updating on the hard drive itself. Whereas if you make a change out on the hard drive, it is not reflected in your Lightroom Classic catalog. Instead, for example, if I had renamed a photo on my hard drive instead of inside of Lightroom, now Lightroom is not able to find the photo based on the file name it's expecting. So the photo is missing. And so in fact, if we go back to our search. So here is the file that I renamed. If I go show that in my finder, or if you're a Windows user, this would be show in Explorer, then here we are. You can see that the file did indeed get renamed out on the hard drive as well. Awesome, awesome. So continuing along, along the lines of that, uh, when using Painter with a second keyword, will that also add the keyword to it? Yes. So if we were, I think what we're using here, we were using the Palouse, I think that was 2019 folder. And so here, if I had assigned, um, let's see, where was it? Here's an image where I'd assigned canola first, and then I came back with crop duster. Do we get both keywords then? Yes. You can see here that I have both canola and crop duster as keywords for the photo. So I'm adding, I'm not replacing keywords, I'm adding additional keywords. So you won't lose anything at all by using that painter. And you could just, you know, if I, what, what else do we have? Well, that's all just, oh, there's a little wheat in the background here, for example. So I could also use the painter to add wheat as a keyword. And then we would just have that additional keyword added to the photo as well. Great. And so kind of, kind of on the converse of that, uh, Valentina was asking, she assigned favorite folders to some folders, but now she can't remove them. Any tips on, on, you know, fixing that, remedying that? I assume referring to the little star, the favorite status for a folder, then you would just right click and unmark favorite. So maybe she just didn't see that feature. Hopefully it's not that she's choosing it and it's not working. Uh, that would be a bug. <laughs> but if I just, uh, so, you know, let's say this Austria 2018 was not actually a favorite, I could right click and unmark favorite and you'll see, oh, wow, it's not disappearing. Gotcha. So Valentina so maybe, is actually saying that it is a bug according to, according to what she's seeing. There you have it. So, so then uh, let's call Adobe. <laughs> now, don't, what call I will say don't, is, don't call Tim with this. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> it's not my fault. And so one thing that I have noticed, the related sort of glitch is sometimes you'll make changes in Lightroom and the change doesn't appear to have taken effect. 
Uh, this is not one that I've run into. So thanks, Valentina, for letting me know about that. But what I've found is oftentimes if you then quit Lightroom and start it up again, it magically reconnects itself and you know gets itself straightened out. So I'm not sure if that's going to be the case here or if this is just, uh, it actually was removed. So you can see that my menu option is now mark as favorite as, oppo as opposed to removing that uh, uh, the uh, are both of these? I oh, know I just said, clicked on the wrong one. So mark versus unmark. So let's take a look. So Austria 2018. I'm curious if I filter by favorites. Oh, it's that's a big bug. So I'm unmarking the favorite, and it's still marked as a favorite. It's still filtering based on a favorite. And so all of the Adobe employees who are watching right now, when you get back to the office. Have somebody fix that for us, if you'd be so kind. <laughs> there you go. Look, look at that. We're, we're fixing things for free today. <laughs> exactly. That's a, that's a freebie. We won't charge anybody <laughs> for that. <laughs> uh, and then uh, Leon is joining us from live stream. I think this question kind of mimics on what we spoke about previously, but maybe a little bit kind of a different twist on it. Sure. Um, if you have a catalog on the laptop and a different one on the computer, so two separate catalogs, is there a way that you can combine them or can you switch between them? Yes. Well, both. So obviously you, let's assume that you needed two catalogs for some purpose. I don't recommend that, but if you did, you could just switch back and forth. You could open a different catalog or if they're on different computers, of course, you could just switch computers. But I really strongly advocate for having a single catalog, as I mentioned earlier, for all of your photos so that you don't have to think about it. Just launch Lightroom and all of your images are there. And then you can use you know, keywords or star ratings or folder structure, whatever it takes to locate particular photos that you need. And so you absolutely can import, or I should say merge catalogs. It might sound like a little bit of a complicated concept, but it's not too difficult. In fact, I've got an article on the subject. So if anybody wants to contact me then I'll be happy to send them a copy of that article that goes into detail on that. But the idea is that we need to, well, essentially we're just merging. So we're importing from another catalog. So let's say this is my primary catalog and I had a traveling catalog. I went on a trip with my laptop and I didn't have my desktop computer with me, of course. And I downloaded photos onto my laptop into Lightroom Classics. So now I have this traveling catalog. I can then just go into my master catalog and then go up to the file menu and choose the option to import from another catalog. And then I would import from my traveling catalog into my master catalog. So simple in concept, of course, I also then need to have the catalog and the photos from my laptop, for example, available on my desktop. Hopefully I had all of that on an external hard drive so it's a little easier. I could also export the photos so there are some nuances to that that might complicate things, but for our purposes, I'll say, you know, the short answer is yes, absolutely. You can merge catalogs. The process is to simply import. So go to your master catalog and then import from another catalog. And you can repeat that as many times as needed to bring all of your different catalogs into one. Just there's the nuance of, you know, staying organized, keeping track of which catalogs you're working with. And of course, getting those photos and catalogs available on your primary computer. Uh, so taking into account, you know, some of that co complexity, potentially, the overall concept is simple. It's just a matter of getting everything put into the right places. Excellent. Great. So I think that's a great segue to kind of lead into, you know, you mentioned about could get into contact with you and, you know, get some of that information. How can people, how can people get in contact with you? Great question. I'm glad you asked. Uh, well, first off, <laughs> it's well, almost like you, you had a slide prepared. It's almost <laughs> like I thought about this. I anticipated this question. In advance. Yeah. Oh, well, I do want to say first off, thanks. Thanks to you. Thanks to the BNH photo event space for hosting me and for everybody who tuned in through all of the various platforms to tune in live, or I'm sure some they'll be able to tune in after the fact. Uh, if you want to learn more, especially about Lightroom Classic, this uh, link here, timgray.me slash 10 classic will take you to a bundle that we're working on with a variety of contact, but that bundle lives at the Gray Learning website. So as long as you remember that my last name has an E rather than an A, G-R-E-Y, graylearning.com, and that will get you to the video training courses and whatnot, or just timgrayphoto.com, which will give you all the details about essentially everything that I do, all the ways that you can find me online. And there's contact pages there that you can use. Obviously I'm on social media as well. Uh, generally speaking as Tim Gray photo and uh, I've got email. I'd get a ton of email. So it's not always the best way to reach out, but using the contact page on the website is a really good option. 
to uh, track me down and just to get information about the various things that I'm doing, including, you know, photo workshops that yes, next year we will be leading field photography workshops once again, and the video training and our Pixology magazine and just all the different things that keep me really, really busy, uh, but that can help you to learn to optimize your workflow and your photography. Amazing. Well, Tim, I want to I want to extend thanks to you as well for for spending your, your last hour with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. We had a great time. Uh, I hope everybody, you know, kind of enjoyed everything that they learned here, maybe took a, a little tidbit away from this. I know I definitely did. Uh, I learned that Tim definitely needs some help out with the social media. So, you know, like I said, run <laughs> it up, get him some more followers. He's he's dropping a ton of knowledge out there. And, uh, you know, we all could, could gain knowledge no matter what. Um, so, Tim, thanks a lot for being here with us. Thank uh, you. To everybody. Pleasure. Yep. To everybody uh, joining us today, we really appreciate you joining us as well. Like Tim said, if you do want to replay this event, you can go to livestream.com backslash BH event space, and that'll actually allow you to review any of the information here or any of the webinars that we've presented over the course of all eternity. Uh, so make sure you check that out. If you want to just kind of go back to something that Tim went over and, you know, slow it down, you can definitely do that as well. Otherwise, thanks again for joining us. 